behalf of Greece for the 70th birthday of our dear Swami, a drama entitled The Spiritual Message of Greece. This play is a brief theatrical presentation of the great masters of ancient Greece, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Alexander the Great. The entire scenario of the play is based on sayings and revelations given by our Lord during interviews that he granted last summer to a group of devotees from Greece. The whole play was inspired and prepared by the love, grace, and divine care of Swami. We are very grateful to Swami's students and all the others for their great help and support. Therefore, it is dedicated to the lotus feet of the Supreme Creator, Director, another period of decline. Socrates is prominent among the people and philosophers. But who is Socrates? His name tells his identity. So is. So creator is. That is God. He is a divine teacher who has come to speak about God for those who still have ears to listen. He has come to wake up his fellow men from the sleep of delusion and to lead them to the knowledge of Atma. Hey, you! Why don't you greet me? Who are you? Who am I? This is exactly what I'm searching for. Please, tell me, who am I? The motto of Socrates' teaching is Know thyself. This is what he teaches with his example throughout all his life. His task is to create disciples. Socrates recalls the story from the Upanishad and says, Look, bring some water and a little sugar. Pour the sugar in the water. Stir for a while. Where is the sugar now? I cannot see it, Guruji. Can you touch it then? I cannot touch it, Guruji. Take a few drops and put them in your mouth. Ah, 
Now I understand. You see, my son, the sugar is everywhere in the water. You cannot see it. You cannot touch it. But you can taste it. In the same way, God is everywhere. He is omnipresent. We cannot see him. We cannot touch him. But we can experience him. So, you see, the only true knowledge is the one that you get from experience. Every other kind of knowledge is external and artificial. again immersed in deep meditation. Last time, he remained in Samandhi for three days. Socrates sees God, hears God, breathes God, moves in God. He especially loves the youth, for in the youth of today, he sees the masters of the future. That's why his main mission is to shape real disciples. Guruji, why does God give us only a hundred years of life? The first 25 years are spent in childhood and youth when the mind is still immature and scattered. In the next 25 years, man raises a family and is busy with his duties and children. In the forthcoming 25 years, his children have grown up and he is busy getting them settled, properly married and ensuring their happy future. The last 25 years that remain is the only period when he has time to think of himself and of his future. In these hundred years, there is no time for someone to think of God. Perhaps. If God gave us another 25 years of life, we would have enough time to think of him. For a few minutes, Socrates remained silent. Then, start crying. It's the first time we see our guru crying. What could it mean? Guru! Guruji. What has happened? happened? What's what happened? Happened? My children, look around you. Here God made mountains. Over there are rivers and lakes. Further down fields and the busy city. There is no place left for me. Where am I going to live now? Guruji, you say that God has made so many places. Why do you tell us that there is no place for you to live? Since you say that during a hundred years there is no time to think of God, then, in the midst of so many places, there is no room for me to live either. then they don't make room for a Socrates to live amongst them. Guruji is crying for the ignorance of men and a blind road they find themselves upon. Do you think he might go? Do you think he would leave us? What do you say, Plato? Socrates foresees the future. This story is a perfect reflection of our situation today. The students are shaking. Things are going from bad to worse. The prophecies of Socrates are coming true. Many people, especially the priests and the men of the government, cannot stand the presence of Socrates, for he is a mirror for them. They put him on trial with the false and slanderous accusations of disrespect towards the gods and the corruption of the youth. Socrates makes his own defense 
during the trial. He uncovers the hidden motive of his accuser, proves his innocence, and with his behavior upholds dharma. Nevertheless, he is found guilty by the court, and he is sentenced to death. After the trial, he is taken to prison, where he spends the last days of his life. Guruji, the time is at hand. We proposed to you so many times to escape, but you refused. Even now, at the last minute, there is still time. The prison keepers could be of help. Friends are ready to take you to a safe place where you will be able to live in peace and comfort. My dear Cretan, what answer would I give to the laws of the fatherland if they asked me, Socrates, why don't your actions follow your words? The prison keeper, he's bringing the poison for the guru. I am so sorry, Guruji, but it's my duty. Socrates calmly takes the poison. No, Guruji! No, no Guruji! No, 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 don't drink it! No, 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 no. When your legs become heavy, you should lie down. Why are you sad for my death? Why are you crying? These are not emotions of spiritual men. There is no death. The body dies. But we are not the body. We are not the emotions. We are not the mind. We are the immortal Atma. The body comes and goes, but the Atma in remains. So don't be sad. This is body consciousness. Always remember, Atma, Atma, Atma. to depend totally on ourselves, God within us. Really, Plato, how did you come to know Socrates? Ah, it was an unforgettable experience. I wanted to approach him for a long time, but I didn't dare. However, one day I made up my mind in spite of my trembling feet. I saw him sitting somewhere apart in the market and I slowly went towards him, searching for words to say. But he had already seen me, and when I approached him, he told me, Come, sit down. You must be him. I said, Who do you think I am, Socrates? Plato is my name. I don't know your name, he said. But last night, 
I had a dream. I had a very small swan on my knees. And as I parted it, suddenly its wings started growing and growing while this swan was singing in a sweet, melodious voice. Did you understand the meaning of the dream? I asked him, and he responded that this swan was me, and that the dream means that I have a great task to fulfill, and that glory awaits me. At the time, I did not know what he meant, but today I begin to understand. Now, I know what my life's mission is. Plato, what are you thinking of doing now? I will go into retreat to preserve our Guru's work. Retreat for meditation and inner quest. He meditates on God and he perceives him as truth, goodness, beauty. Satyam, Sivam, Sudaram. He decides to write down the teachings of Socrates and this is what he does the first year. He becomes the channel of his Guru's wisdom. Plato returns to Athens and establishes his spiritual academy, which is throbbing with life, full of youth with zeal for learning and spiritual quest. Plato sees education as the most effective method of reforming the world. Through the continuous teaching of human values, the unceasing inner quest, and by his example, Plato implants in the hearts and the minds of the youth the virtues of goodness, purity, and service toward society. He encourages them for the quest of the good and for spiritual life. Guruji, speak to us about God. God is truth. Truth is that which never changes, the unchangeable. God is truth and truth is God. God is goodness. God is beauty. Guruji, where can we find beauty? In nature. Real beauty is eternal. Beauty is truth. Beauty is God. Truth, goodness and beauty are all one. Truth is God's form. Goodness is God's form. Beauty is God's form. Guruji, what is real power? Real power is the ability to resist the pull of desires, the control of desires and of the senses. Guruji, what is the true form of government? In a true government state, God and his laws are supreme. Through the laws, God expresses his commands. Whoever wants to be happy must humbly follow the divine law, the law of Manu and divine justice. To follow God means I am one with God. In the happiest society, one can never hear I and mine. The only way we can be guided towards an ideal society is through correct education, that is, the creation of good character. Isn't it so, Aristotle? Yes, Guruji. Guruji, is the world that is revealed to us by the senses real? No, Aristotle. It is a theater of continuous changes and multiplicity of forms. In true science, spirituality, is far and above the senses. That's why we should devote this life to the worship and glory of God. Plato is a true devotee. He is one with God. His works are springs of spiritual inspiration 
for thousands of people for more than 2,000 years. His academy is a spiritual beacon for men for almost 10 centuries. Alexander, my son, you should not depend on your ego, rather turn entirely to God. Surrender to Him and have control over your senses. See God in everyone, respect all. Only in this way will you bring about the brotherhood of men and the fatherhood of God in your heart and around you. Keep well in mind what I tell you now. The physical universe contains billions and billions of suns, innumerable planets, near and small, and countless beings. In this vast cosmos, the Earth is smaller than a minute drop. On this Earth, Greece, is just a very small country. In it, there is a small city-state, and within that, a still minor district. There is a very small village within it, and an insignificant house in the village. In this very small house, a still smaller body is sitting. Now, what do you think? Wouldn't it be funny for this minute body to swell up with egoism and vainglory. If we take into consideration its microscopic size in comparison with the entire universe. So, don't depend on your ego or on the world, but rather depend on God. Only God exists. Aristotle was a man whom Alexander admired and loved from his very youth. He had great devotion for him. Maharaj, what makes you have such great devotion for Aristotle? He is my guru. To my father, I owe my life. To my guru, my guidance and transformation. I've been the king of Macedonia for two years now. Something inside me tells me to expand my kingdom. I don't believe that my role and mission is restricted just to Macedonia. Alexander, I have taught you for so many years basic spiritual principles which I believe you will put into practice 
wherever you go. You should remember that race, language, and religion do not separate men. God unites them all. He is in the heart of each and everyone. Keep your mind steady on this, and through this, God will guide and direct you always. Guruji, I owe you everything. Your words are true, Satya, which are implanted deep in my heart. I promise to put into practice all that you taught me. Alexander, I have a present for you. This ring is a green diamond. Green symbolizes the peace of mind that we should always have. This ring is a symbol of knowledge and wisdom of my dear Guru Plato and our great Guruji Socrates. Guruji, the gifts you have given me are invaluable. This ring as I will see it every day will remind me of you. It will be a constant reminder of your divine word. Alexander, listen to me carefully. After a long journey, you will reach a great country called Bharat, India. Bharat means a country whose people have a deep devotion to God. This country is the birthplace of spirituality. All the great spiritual teachers come from there. Even God himself is incarnated there as Avatar. Even our gurus, Plato and the divine Socrates, have originated from there. It is our spiritual birthplace. When you reach this country, you will not fight it. You will respect it. Let its spirit permeate you. You will stay there five years. You will meet great enlightened gurus. You will have the great fortune to meet sannyasis and to be instructed into their greatness and wisdom. They will touch your heart and transform you. On your way back, I want you to bring me five things of divine value. Earth, from the holy land of Bharat. Water, from the sacred Ganga. The sacred book of the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam, and, if you can, a sannyasin. Guruji, please my journey. Great work 
Alexander finally meets his sacred Indian. Alexander was a dead and the motivating force of his army and of the men who moved him. He was the rising son, the example of renunciation in spite of his royal position. He had faith in God. He was charismatic. And no one could help loving him, not even his enemies, for his brilliant character. Maharaj, the soldiers are tired. They can't go on any further. The long journey and the harsh conditions have exhausted them. They keep asking, how long are we going to march? Please, speak to them. You know how to encourage and move them forward. My beloved, I know you are tired, but you shouldn't forget that the divine power guides me in this journey. This divine power enabled us to reach this point. Nothing can happen without God's will. Take courage with this knowledge and brace yourself. With this same divine power, we will carry on. I am the first one to take this burden of all the hardships and difficulties. I live like you and share everything with you. You and I are one, bound together with a deep love. The power of the one God is our power. Don't identify yourself with the demands of the body, which is only an instrument in God's hands. Jai Maharaj Alexander Ji Ki Jai! Jai Maharaj Alexander Ji Ki Jai! Jai Maharaj Alexander Ji Ki Jai! The spirit of devotion of Arjuna the universal student governs Alexander. During the whole of this long and major expedition, he gives a brilliant example of a true leader with rare qualities like power, courage, decisiveness, virtue, and kindness. Our king envisioned the expansion of his kingdom and he succeeded in bringing it about. We went through so many countries, from Egypt to Kirin, to Syria, Palestine, Mesopotamia, Babylon, to the ends of Bactria, Lydia, Persia, and we reached as far as here, India, Bahar. In spite of all his numerous conquests, he respected all the people and religions, treating all the conquered people fairly and generously. He placed just and virtuous rulers everywhere. He punished the malicious and supported the devout. He respected the religions of all men and prayed to all the local deities. He encouraged the citizens to live peacefully by performing good deeds and by worshipping God. He did many works for the public benefit, developed the values, and spread civilization. But just think of it. In spite of all the riches that pass through his hands, he keeps nothing for himself, neither money nor property. And with total detachment, he gives everything away. Yes. And did you see how he's always first on the battlefield? He's never scared and is an example of self-sacrifice for us all. His decisions are made immediately on the spot, and he resolves all difficulties, however unsurpassable they may seem. I want to go further into this country also, but my good words keep coming into my mind. Alexander, when you reach India, you will not fight it, you will respect it, you will let its spirit permeate you. By now I have a whole empire. 
so many riches, so many subjects, so many nations, my devoted army. But do I have peace? Do I have tranquility and happiness? I have a whole kingdom. But still, I am not satisfied. What is my destination beyond all this? We shall go on. Where to, Maharaj? Through this path deeper into India. Get off the path. The great emperor of Greece, Alexander, is marching on with his army to conquer India, and you remain indifferent? Get up, or I'll cut your head off. Wait. My soldiers threatened to kill you, but you'd seem very happy. If you were an ordinary man, you would immediately surrender. You would kneel in front of him, asking for his forgiveness. But you only smile. What could this mean? cannot hurt me. Fire cannot burn me. Water cannot wet me. Air cannot move me. I have never been born and I will never die. I am the immortal Atma. This is my reality. This soldier here threatens to kill me by cutting the head from this body. But this is just funny. It makes me laugh. It is very natural for men to be afraid when they face death or when somebody threatens to kill them. But seldom one laughs and is so happy when he's about to die. In India there are men who have achieved such a sublime state in the spiritual life that they are not afraid even of death. How can I conquer such a nation? No, I will not do it. I turn my army back. I'm not going further into India. Alexander's soul thirsts for spiritual development. The spirit of this great country and the presence of the wise man have deeply touched 
of his heart. His words wake up Alexander's being and dinner destination. He feels an esoteric bond. Sandor has been searching for, finally becomes clear to see. He decisively approaches the river. Swan, would you accept me as your disciple? Come sit near me, Alexander. You want to conquer? Conquer your true self. This is the true hero. Renounce all this if you want me to teach you. But how? The army? The kingdoms? All? The renunciation is internal, not external. The expansion of your kingdom that you always desired is the inner expansion that you should do in order to discover the Atma inside you. Alexander, you needed to go through all that you did till now in order to reach the point of renouncing them. Look at these weapons that you carry. These are not real weapons. Weapons are the spiritual principles that Aristotle taught you. Good character, a heart full of love, and a sharp intellect. Alexander lived with the riches for five years. During this time, and with the influence of his teachers, he is transformed every day. The grace and the blessings of his present gurus are added to that already given to him by Aristotle. sacred Ganga, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Bhagavatam that you studied for so many years. I feel that something has not been completed. And if you can, a sannyasi. Alexander, come here near me. I have decided I will leave my ashram and I'll come with you as long as it needs. I believe you still need me. Alexander starts his journey back the way he came, passing again through the same place. The Rishi lives with him and teaches him. His spiritual task and the guidance that Alexander needs have now been completed. His body has become too weak and frail, 
and so he puts himself on the funeral pile. With complete attachment and peace, he says to Alexander before he leaves. Alexander, I'll see you soon in Babylon. Alexander continues his journey, and upon reaching Babylon, he falls seriously ill and has the feeling that his end is very near. Why are you crying? Be happy. Remember me when you are happy. My guru tells me that happiness is a necessary element for self-realization. It is one of the gates leading to divinity. Not to be happy is not just a mistake. It is the most serious of four mistakes. See how I live with empty hands. I take nothing with me. This is the one truth you should remember. There is nothing else. Only God. In my mind, there is only God. 